Hello everyone, my name is Adli Wahid from APNIC. Uh, I've been working in this uh, space for more than 10, 15 years already. I used to work for a national cert in Malaysia and then I moved to a banking cert. Uh, and uh, on and off I've been doing some work for FIRST, uh, trying to encourage more collaboration and cooperation between teams to improve overall security of our industry. Hello from me too. My name is Serge Ross. I'm the vice chair of FIRST, the Forum of Instance Response and Security Teams. I work in a day job for a managed security provider called Open Systems, and I've been in the field of cybersecurity for more than 20 years by now. And today we would like to talk about the dark side of the net, of the dark alleys of the internet. Who are the actors and how do they operate? Hollywood kind of tries us or tries to make us believe that a typical hacker is a teenager that feeds exclusively of pizza and wears a black hoodie, but that's far from the truth. Um, let's take a step back and look at how the scene works. At the beginning of each of our kind of endeavors of our jobs is a hacked computer. This can be a phone, it can be a big server, it can be a server farm, but it's always a hacked or compromised computer. What does it take to hack a computer, Adli? Well, I think at the very bottom, uh, of the very essence of things, um, uh, a computer generally today, I think, you know, has become more and more secure. Like many of the operating systems, uh, people who develop operating systems, make sure that you know, the operating system is up to speed with security best practices and whatnot. And many organizations are putting in place you know, security controls and mitigation, and then there's lots of security awareness. So I think, in general, it is quite difficult to hack an individual computer. Uh, so a lot of work takes place uh, you know, that happens uh, in, within the security underground to understand you know, how, how best it is to compromise a security system. Uh, so a lot of work uh, is involved in identifying weaknesses of systems and then building you know, the necessary exploits uh, around that. And what I want to say here is that sometimes it takes the work of professionals to get inside computers and to have this expertise being sold uh, to others who wishes to compromise computer systems. You say these exploits are sold. Mm -hmm. How much do they cost? Uh, well, the cost, I think, depends on the value of what attackers do want. Uh, so for example, I think uh, there was a piece of news where the FBI paid 1.3 million to break into uh, iOS. Uh, but there are also other information that are available out there where you know, uh, actors are willing to pay a huge sum of money, uh, not only to buy exploits, but also to make sure those who find vulnerabilities to hide the information uh, from being uh, distributed widely, right? So if I discover something, maybe on a piece of critical uh, software uh, that is used widely out there. Uh, there could be buyers who would tell me that, you know, instead of publishing it, why don't you sell it to us for a certain number of, certain amount of money? I think it's interesting that you actually mentioned the FBI because technically we're talking about the bad guys now and obviously the FBI doesn't belong to the bad guys. Um, so there seems to be kind of buyers and sellers on both sides and that makes it sometimes a little difficult, but we'll continue with the bad guys for now. Yeah. And now, okay, I forked out all the money to get this, this kind of special key that gets me into it, mm -hmm. but on the internet, how do I do this? I mean, I can't just walk up to a computer and, and hack it. How, do I, how does, does this work? How does hacking at a scale work? Yeah, so I think this is where it's quite interesting to understand that there is the, the, the whole dark side of the internet. As you mentioned earlier, where you know, there are a group of people who operate professionally uh, in going after you know, systems uh, and you know, collecting uh, system through you know, vulnerabilities that they, they found uh, and offering them uh, to potential buyers, right? So a group of people, you can, you can imagine a group of people going on a day-to-day -day basis, scanning the whole internet, you know, getting involved in so, all sorts of you know, research and development to get access to different computer systems and collecting them in one place and then offering them through maybe a, a, a forum that is only open to certain users or certain people, uh, offering them to potential buyers to say that, hey, if you want 
access to a computer in a particular location or in a particular country, we have access to, to, to those. And for a certain amount of money, uh, then we are able to you know, let you have access to these systems, right? And I think what, what, what is very important for people to understand is that you know, um, um, to get access to these systems you know, by default, it is not that, it is not that easy. Uh, but you know, there are a group of people who are very enterprising Right? Uh, these are the criminals who know that they are able to get some money from this kind of work, then, and then offering them to potential buyers uh, you know, using different forums. And uh, I guess you may have heard of you know, uh, you know, criminal gangs that operate on the internet, you know, selling access either in terms of information or access to service in different, in different places. So mm -hmm. this information is actually, and we're talking about a lot of computers, we've, we've seen criminal gangs with tens of thousands of hacked computers, up to millions. I think the largest number I ever heard was a gang that controlled 20 million computers. You don't do this with a piece of paper and a pen. So you actually need sophisticated software to manage that, those assets. We call them exploit kits, and there's different ones for sale or for rent. They typically go for about 700 to 1,000 dollars a month. Uh, there's different charging models, but what we also see is that the ones that come with nice user interfaces sell a lot better than others. Uh, I find this kind of really very interesting. Okay, now I, we learned how, how you hack computers, how you get access to computers, kind of like the burglar that now has the key to get into a house. What do you do once you have a hacked computer? Um, what's the next step? that you have to do to become a real, true cyber criminal? So I guess it depends on what, what you actually want right, from, from a system. So I, I guess you know, going back you know, into you know, what, why we do security in the first place, uh, a lot of organizations state that you know, the, the, the main objectives of doing security in the first place is to protect assets or information assets, so things that are very valuable to the organization. So it could be you know, information about a transaction, it could be you know, plans of the business or product design, or it could be information about customers and so on and so forth. So try to think from the now from the perspective of an attacker. An attacker can now have access to a system uh, that belongs to your organization. So what do they actually want out of it, right? Uh, it could be something that is valuable to you, or something that could affect your business, or something that will have value and can be sold to, to other parts, uh, so to, to others um, in the, in the cyber, cyber world, for, for instance. So I think this is where you know, um, an attacker or potential criminal can then you know, zoom in to what is valuable and look for ways to obtain those information. So for example, now they have gained access to a computer system, uh, they might be interested in looking at emails, right? So now they will go into your mailbox and try to extract those emails or they are interested to go uh, to obtain some files uh, uh, that contains information about your products, right? And now looking in places, maybe a, a shared drive or a directory that contains this information, once they have access to that, then maybe the question would be, how do, I, how do they get those information out from your organization you know, for further processing or further, further analysis, uh, so to speak? So, you know, all of that takes some work, uh, and you know, there is a lot of tools that could be involved in, in doing those. And I think if we are trying to defend our network, then it is also very important to understand you know, what happens on the network, on machines, so that we are able to detect, detect early. OK, so but how do they do this technically? I think mm -hmm. what we've always hear is, is you have a virus. That's kind of often you hear this in the movies. That sometimes you you get a phone call. Somebody tells you that. What does it really mean? And I think that's the tool of choice for the internet criminals. Once they have access to reach the goals you just described, they install a piece of software because that's what you run on a computer. Most people call it a virus, as I said. Mm -hmm. We kind of call it a piece of malware because we don't really know what a virus means in that context. But essentially, it's a tool that allows you to obtain your goal, looking at the emails, stealing information, encrypting your computer. We then call it ransomware. And again, it's something that you can buy uh, that 
you can give to someone and say, hey, please install this on 10,000 Scottish computers because we would like to attack the Royal Bank of Scotland, being in Scotland here. Mm -hmm. You can give it to them and it will be a specialized piece of software that really caters to the e-banking system, say, of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, or, I don't know, Credit Suisse or whatever bank you would like to. And some of these campaigns we see are very regional. Uh, we've seen malware families that only pop up in German-speaking countries. Others are of global nature, or all kinds of different things. Um, I think it's important to understand that, that we are again dealing with a piece of software that you can buy. And surprisingly, what we see in the underground market is that this software often comes with a license. The same way we would use licenses for regular legal software, and the underground seems to have its own mechanisms of enforcing the licenses. How, how would they do this? Well, I think there are multiple ways. Um, I think, so this, this whole um, cyber underground uh, enterprise you know, operates on, on some basis of you know, trust or SLAs, uh, as you would say. You know, uh, I think the, the groups who are selling the software will be closely monitoring the usages uh, of, of the software that they are selling to the outside parties. You know, I think they have some rules uh, that they apply amongst themselves. For, for example, if I bought something from, from a criminal, I am not able to share it with others, right? Uh, and I think there are ways to monitor it. Uh, I think uh, we've seen cases in the past where if they see that you have violated your licenses, then they would then upload the malware that they shared with you or that they have sold you or rent out to you to virus, um, virus, uh, antivirus companies, uh, to sites like Virus Total, so that now that piece of malware can be detected. So that so piece of malware can no longer be used, you know, to to uh, as part of the attack that are carried out to organizations. So we talked a lot about software, but we all know to run software you need hardware, and criminals need hardware, they need servers to run their infrastructure, their databases on, and do they just go to normal hosting companies or do they run their own data centers or how does this work, Adley? I think in a lot of cases we, we find that uh, when attackers or when criminals operate, you know, one is that they basically have to use the normal internet that we, we, we have to use, we are using today so they operate on the same internet that we 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 operate on to do our legit transactions uh, but of course there is this element of they need availability right so if they are running you know a server uh, for you know for keeping track of infected devices or or servers that maintains that you know back channel to servers that have been compromised they need that availability or confidence that you know this will always be up and therefore they will be on the local for hosting providers that can assure you know, that you know, the servers will always be up despite getting complaints from maybe certs or from law enforcement agencies that wanted to take down or requests from organizations that would like to do forensics on servers that are running uh, on, on those hardware. Uh, and I think in, in our world, we call this you know, uh, providers that are cooperating with criminals, bulletproof hosting providers. Uh, and basically, you know, by being bulletproof, it basically means that they just ignore all the complaints that they get and, and, and as much as possible try to help the criminals to achieve their goals instead of helping, you know, good people respond to security incidents or mitigate, uh, you know, an attack or, or a problem. It always mm -hmm. puzzled me how this is possible. How can you run a data center kind of focused on criminal activities without being just taken down by law enforcement. And the reason you can do this is that they pretend to cooperate. When you ask them for information or ask them to take down a system, they'll always reply and say, hey, we don't see anything. Can you provide more evidence? And if law enforcement actually shows up, the police, mm -hmm. they cannot just take down an entire data center. They can take down an individual server and confiscate it. But because the criminals make so much money with their enterprises and their activities, it still pays a lot. And so we really have a big problem here yeah. that, we, that we need to solve. And I think law enforcement has become a little better in taking these enterprises uh, 
an organization is down, but there's still a way to go. But when we talk about illegal activities, OK, hacking some computer probably is not illegal, but what is it that, that's real criminal that they do? What are some of the activities they do? Well, I think there are, there are, the activities that they carry out varies uh, you know, um, at, at, uh, over a wide spectrum, you know, just from you know, maybe stealing confidential information to maybe using or repurposing the hacked devices or, or systems to launch attacks on others, so launching a distributed denial of service attacks, uh, doing ransomware where they you know, ask money from organizations who have been infected by that piece of malware for money or else you know, your information will be deleted forever uh, and, and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of you know, stealing money from banking, uh, banking accounts uh, of, of users. So you know, are, these are people who specialize in going after uh, e-banking or internet banking uh, users. Uh, there are also organizations that you know, use the, the servers that have been compromised to relay spams, right? So you get all the spams out there. Um, which some of them then you know, try to either do phishing or infect a computer and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of things that can be committed through you know, hacking a device uh, and you know, there's multiple usages for it. And I think this is where the, the, the problem is. Um, you know, there's always demand for, for such things to be conducted uh, on the internet and therefore, there is always uh, a group of people who look for opportunities to have access to all the systems so that it can be sold and, or rented out to those who want to commit you know, things that are illegal or evil, in, in, in my, my, my thinking. It's also very interesting uh, that you mentioned earlier, Serge, about you know, what, how can it be possible for you know, these enterprises or these bulletproof hosting companies to, to, to exist. I think one of the problems is the nature of the internet itself, it's very distributed, right? So um, a bulletproof hosting company can you know, start out their business in Hong Kong, for example. If they face a lot of issues there, then they can easily move out to another country where maybe the law enforcement you know, or the, the laws are very weak, right? Uh, so they have their infrastructure quite well distributed, so it's not as easy as just going to one location and taking everything apart. Uh, but also sometimes you need to actually go to different places and have collaboration or cooperation from folks like the CERT or the LEAs to be able to address this problem. So time is on their side. I think that's what we're, we're trying to say here. And therefore, you know, trying to address this issue uh, requires collaboration and, and also understanding how things work uh, on the internet. So this is really mm -hmm. kind of a disturbing, and I totally agree with you, that the internet is not really made for hunting down criminals. I think they, they profit from the fact that law enforcement has a hard time collaborating across borders. Uh, they also profit from the fact that you can commit a crime on a large scale, you can hack thousands of computers, you can steal credit card information from thousands of computers, you can hack databases and steal the credit card information. And these people are very, very uh, creative and innovative. Uh, the things that, that we see with which they make money is incredible. One thing that still is kind of mind boggling to me is we once were after a gang that stole mouse clicks and you think, how can you make money with mouse clicks? Well, what they did with the mouse clicks is they clicked on ads and, and if you click on an ad on your website or someone clicks on it, you get a little money. And Companies are very good at detecting fake or artificial mouse clicks, but human mouse, mouse clicks are just that, they're human mouse clicks. So this gang specialized in stealing mouse clicks, which I thought was mind boggling. For me, the take home message here really is uh, the internet underground today is a service oriented market economy. It's money driven, it's people that want to make money. They don't really care how, they, they don't, haggle about our Macs better than Windows PCs, and they just want to make money. And they provide your services, they find niches, market niches, which they grow and make money. And, and that's the people that make our lives difficult. But are these the only ones? Are these the only bad guys? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think um, in the last few years, in some of our forums where we, we meet with other certs and other security teams, uh, there have been a lot of discussion about you know, um, actors who are nation states, you know, countries who perform cyber operations against another country for the purpose of espionage uh, or, or whatever. Uh, and I think it makes it uh, a bit interesting um, from the perspective that uh, in a lot of cases, the tools, the techniques that are being used is very similar to the ones that are used by the criminal enterprise. So it, it poses a challenge uh, in terms of, you know, one, dealing with such attacks because to the defender, they are just, you know, another attack that happens another day. Uh, but also there could be some sensitivities in terms of sharing information behind the attacks because maybe nation states would like to, you know, make their operation secret and don't want you know, countries or security teams to be sharing this information across, across board. Um, that's number one. And number two, what is also very interesting is that you know, some of the attacks, uh, although they are intending to target uh, security, uh, another nation or a specific target of a nation state, uh, those attacks can spill over to you know, normal individuals or enterprises or organization you know, with, with very little security uh, in place. So that makes it also interesting. And I guess the other point that, uh, that is uh, also in the discussion is that um, some of the nation states do actually spend a lot of money in buying vulnerabilities uh, or information related to vulnerabilities. So, so what this means basically uh, is that you know, if someone discover a vulnerability, uh, another uh, a nation state actor might, might, might make the offer uh, so that that information will not be shared to the vendors who are you know, writing the software and therefore the vulnerability remains open uh, and both nation state actors and non-nation state actors can exploit the vulnerabilities and you know, make the world more insecure. So that nation states spy on each other is not really something new. The first, of the first operation I heard of that involved the nation state happened already in 2003 and was a classical espionage thing. One state kind of stealing military secrets from another one. What we see increasingly though is that nation states go after civil society. Uh, these may be certain totalitarian regimes that, that use cyber means to surveil their population, to surveil dissidents. It may also be uh, um, nation states that are interested in kind of political secrets. Uh, we've, handled an incident recently where, where a large non-governmental organization was infiltrated by an, a nation state and we have no reason why but it seemed to have been like quite a big operation and there were also cases known where, where supposed nation state actors actually attacked members of the security industry, companies of the security industry in very sophisticated manner so what that seems to indicate is that there's a lot of energy and a lot of, of know-how and funds available to attack adversaries. And that is, is very, very concerning because there is the potential for escalation and it also creates a total asymmetry. If a state goes after a, an individual, it's just totally asymmetric. Uh, an individual has no chance of escaping that. And that's kind of worrying for me. And I feel it's very important that people are aware of that and protect against that. Because as you said, I think at the end of the day, nation states, they may have the bigger toys, but there's still the same principles behind it. Yeah, so I think maybe just to add a bit more on, on, on this, uh, what's also interesting here is that, you know, in a lot of forums uh, where this, this discussion about, you know, actors behind attacks takes place is that sometimes uh, the attack could be very targeted. So, so let's say, for example, one, Country X is targeting, you know, another country, and this is part of, you know, some nation-state activities. Uh, the danger sometimes is the spillover effect of those attacks that goes into the civilian systems, or that are targeting infrastructure that are used for day-to-day -day internet, for example, an IXP uh, or an ISP uh, that is part of the communication channel, you know. Uh, in, in, in the attack is compromised. So now it affects not only the target, but also others within the system. So I think this makes it a bit uh, interesting. And this is where I think policymakers, uh, as well as the technical folks, 
uh, who are addressing cybersecurity need to you know, sit and have more discussion on implications of such attacks against you know, civilian systems or, did, uh, or individuals uh, that are probably you know, not as, um, uh, not, not the initial target of a, of a state actor operations. So mm -hmm. you, we now talked a lot about attrib attribution in a sense. So what is, the, what is the state of this? How do we know who did an attack and who did an, uh, initiate an operation? Yeah, so I think in my experience of doing cert, uh, cert work, um, of course, you know, we, we try to as much as possible when we handle an, an incident uh, is to you know, mitigate the incident from spreading and then advise you know, users on how to prevent themselves or how to protect themselves against you know, attacks X or Y. But there's also always an element where people want to find out who is behind this attack, right? So they will tell me, Adli, it's good that you know, we understand how the attack works, but really, we really want to know who is behind it. So I guess this is uh, what you're talking about here, where we want to attribute, right? We want to attribute an attack or a campaign or an act of, you know, um, uh, an act that compromises a system to a person or a group or an individual. And I think, you know, through, throughout the discussions that we are having so far, uh, you can probably, uh, you know, see that it's not so easy to attribute, to assign, you know, blame to someone or, or to an, a, a group uh, of people, at least immediately, you know, because it takes a lot of work. Uh, you know, we have to gather evidence, we have to analyze. Uh, the internet is very wide open, right? And people can operate from, you know, various places. So an actor can, you know, in a, a particular country to avoid blame may, you know, set up their shop in a different country or, or they use a, pub, you know, a publicly available services, right? So when you do all the investigation, it leads to a particular country or particular location where, you know, the actual attacker or, or actor might be located in a whole, you know, different location. So attribution can, can happen, but uh, I think people need to really understand uh, that, you know, actors sometimes uh, make sure that it is not going to be very easy. Uh, and sometimes, you know, to gather evidence, you need the cooperation from various, various groups. What do you think, Serge? So, I totally agree. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, very hard. And what makes matters even more difficult is that, that it seems that state actors increasingly start collaborating with criminals. Um, Vladimir Putin actually once said that the Russian state would never conduct a cyber operation against another state, but he could never exclude that patriots would not do this when they get out in the morning and feel they should do something for Russia. This is a very strange statement, but what it means for me is really that states work together with criminals and we've seen operations where, where clearly a state was behind it, but there was also a lot of criminal energy. That makes it really, really hard because we now don't really know is it a state actor that's behind it? Is it a criminal organization that sells this? There is in fact criminal organizations that steal stuff that's interesting to states and sell them. Again, that's not particularly particular to the internet. That's always been the case that people steal information and try to sell it to the best bidder or something like that. But it's really, really hard uh, to understand who who is after you, who is hacking your systems, but just be aware, I think, and that's one of my take home messages, mm -hmm. that there is really powerful adversaries with motives that we don't even understand that may try to attack you and, and harm you. But at the beginning, we started talking about hacked computer and, and we said a little bit about the methods they do, but what are the tools they're actually uh, using? We talked about vulnerabilities, but what are common vulnerabilities, Adli? So I think um, this is where, you know, going back to, you know, the, the basics is, is quite important. Uh, I think throughout the years of doing incident response and doing investigation, when it comes to the techniques, uh, the techniques are pretty much the same, right? Uh, there have not been that much evolution in terms of how people actually go about, you know, compromising systems. So we still, you know, look at things like, you know, buffer overflows where, you know, software can be tricked into executing code that they're not supposed to execute. And this goes, goes back into, you know, having, 
you know, good uh, software development purposes. Uh, and then you have also things like you know, SQL injection, the cross-site scripting. Uh, you have also you know, people just going, scanning about the internet, looking for misconfiguration. You know, that's also uh, very, very common. Um, and uh, also looking for you know, mistakes that people do. I think uh, these days, if you just scan the, uh, the internet with tools that are available, you can easily find databases that are being put on the internet with you know, no passwords or very, very weak passwords. So there are, uh, you know, there are the techniques that we see hackers or attackers use are still the technique that has existed or well known uh, you know, in the past uh, couple of years. So there's, to me, there's nothing new to that, Suresh. What do you think? Well, it worries me a little bit because what you say mm. is that we didn't really learn anything in the past 20 years. And unfortunately, it seems to confirm, you seem to confirm my worst feelings. Like when I look at all this stuff that's now sold as internet of the things, like from the fridge to the light bulb to I don't know what, the automatic door, the feeling that they all have the same mistakes in it, built in it, that we made 20 years ago, indeed is really scary. And uh, but still, when I talk to colleagues and ask them, do you think the internet world is getting better or worse? Typically I hear, well, I think we see less incidents and things have become, computers have evolved and they have become better. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed is us. Yeah, so I think one of the other techniques that are quite common and, and it seems to work uh, every time is the, is the social engineering uh, approach to things where you know, uh, the, the main goal is to trick another person to do something that they shouldn't be doing, right? Uh, and I think in a lot of the attacks that we read about, uh, and I'm sure you have read about, you know, description about all the attacks or breaches that happens, social engineering remains one of the critical elements uh, or technique that is part of the larger attack, where you know someone is is tricked into you know clicking into things, uh, or opening a, a, a file, or you know changing some configuration of a system, right? Uh, and I think this is something that we have to be you know be wary about uh, in terms of you know creating the awareness because this is something where I guess no patch is available for, uh, unlike you know software uh, that that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I'm sure you can talk about some of the attacks that have led to, uh, you know, uh, that were caused by social engineering. Yes, so that last year that. actually we had two incidents where um, someone kind of took over an email conversation and, and, and convinced the person to pay large amounts of money into the wrong banking account. We call this CEO scam, so you suddenly get an email from your supposedly CEO that asks you, please do this and this and do that and that. And people obviously are either afraid of the CEO or want to be really helpful. That is one of the things that we see quite a lot and it's surprising to see the, the amounts. So we're talking about millions of dollars that get lost here. Um, we also see all these supposed Microsoft employees calling people, telling them they have a problem and, and convincing them that they should pay $500 for the problem to get fixed. Um, there's lots of these and that is a causing concern because we don't have any technical solutions against them. What, is, what can we do? Well, I guess, you know, other than creating awareness um, that, you know, attacks do happen through channels such as, you know, social engineering where people, another human, try to convince you into doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, I think this is where you know having the proper process uh, in place could prevent mistakes to happen. So, for example, when it comes to things like CEO fraud, you know, upon receiving an email or call from your CEO supposedly, you know, you should probably should have a process that can actually validate that or verify, uh, you know, before you are taking taking further action, either you know, in, in transferring money or sending money to the, to the attacker. So having process in place uh, is also quite critical, but also you know, having that process in place, in order to have that process in place, you may have to understand you know, how attacks happen uh, in the first place. Yes, so I think really when it comes to social engineering, one of the, the simplest methods that I usually tell people is uh, if you're not really sure if this is, is legitimate, 
ask someone else for a second opinion and just talk to other people about it. Or if you get an email from someone you don't really know, ask someone else who could know, things like that. And I think that would help a lot. Just be aware that there are criminals out there that really try to go after you. They use the internet. Um, there's not really much more we can do about this in, in terms of technological protection. The slides actually give you a lot more examples of things that happened. If you're interested in going into the details, have a look at that. Uh, I think the take home message from this session really is, is that we are up to really mighty adversaries and it's important that we protect ourselves, that we use technical measures we have like use antivirus software, update your systems, use the firewalls and all the other technology that seem to be so cumbersome and just keep, uh, keep awake, watch out for the bad guys that, where they may come of you, be suspicious. Don't be overly suspicious, but just be on the guard. And we do hope you learned something in this session and thanks for listening.